Hi everyone, uh, my name is Martin Lind and I am the economics designer behind Atomicoin and I also have Cameron Sajedi with us who is the distributed computing specialist at Atomicoin. <clears throat> so the, the concept of Atomicoin, the computation of all computation, is in a way it's a, a, a network that computes pieces of deep thought in reference to Douglas Adams, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, or more technically it computes the shape in a mega number. But really the goal of Atomicoin is to advance the science of algorithmic information dynamics by creating a network that approximates the universal distribution by computing Turing machines, thereby providing values inspired by the algorithmic probability as used in a coding theorem method. The team behind the project is uh, come from various backgrounds. Uh, it has a, a weighting towards academic institutions, but also we have people with a background in blockchain technology and cryptocurrencies. Um, and as you can see, there are from some very renowned institutions like Kaos, Karolinska, Algorithmic Dynamics Lab, and Starling Foundries. And the motivation for this project um, it's really looking at how current institutions and research organizations are trying to estimate the universal distribution. So we have covered five states, two symbols, and currently six state, two symbols is being uh, computed. And that wasn't possible without a grant of $450,000 at KAUST. So by taking the problem of estimating the distribution and essentially dividing it into smaller pieces, um, through a network where anyone can participate and compute Turing machines, submit them to the network and get awarded in uh, our native token, we believe that we can accelerate the estimation of the distribution. Um, and we can make it, go, make it to go from something that is kind of one-off events to a, a continuous event that will uh, just keep going effectively. And this will be the benefit for anyone who is using CTM, BDM, or building applications that are uh, fueled by CTM and BDM. So with that, I will pass you over to Cameron, who will discuss some of the design considerations. As Martin said, I'm uh, the, the distributed system specialist here at Automacoin. And uh, to begin, I wanna give you a high level view of the design considerations we tried to incorporate into this early concept. Uh, first and foremost, we want the universal distribution estimations to become a properly managed public good so that there's no antagonistic reason to close off the distribution and keep it private. It'll be open to all relevant scholars. And uh, we, we also want to efficiently capture this output from volunteers and contributing groups so that we can demonstrate the benefit that they're providing and especially to other domains and, and that hopefully that will maintain their motivation to contribute to Automicoin in the future. Uh, a stretch goal that we have is, is for the, the CTM and BDM computational resource requirements are very high. Not as high as, for instance, GPT-3, but still high enough to exclude certain scholars. So we would like for this project to eventually lower the barrier to access for, for these computational um, tools and, may, and, and allow them to become as widespread and widely applied as possible. We also want the distribution itself to be trustable, auditable, and as we move to a permissionless system for participants, we want it to be resilient to the dishonest participants up to a certain point. Uh, that we want the system and the foundation that we're going to, to start to steward the process to act in a manner that continuously improves the system and avoids making themselves obsolete. This might include uh, putting certain constraints around how the empirical, dis the universal distribution is, is accessed and uh, we'll see in the future. And finally, the foundation must maintain a credible relationship with uh, the scientific institutions, industry, and the hobby, hobbyist participants so that it can mediate between all of their disparate concerns. Now that you understand uh, some of the, the concerns, we can talk about a little bit about where we are now. The uh, prior work in this space has gotten us through 
the one through five state and uh, two symbol uh, Turing spaces in a, in a manner in which we can trust the data because it was run in a centralized fashion by the researchers themselves. Uh, right now, as Martin said, uh, KAUST is working through D6 comma two, and uh, we expect to see results from that by the end of this year. Does break in you know, prior data is available to prior data is not available for the seven state uh, Turing universe requires us to kind of launch certain, certain parts of the system before we can move into the seventh state space, such as the validation mechanism and incentives for validation and, and, and good data. And so we intend to use the, the first phase to check our implementation and our assumptions about these mechanisms before moving into this unbroken ground where volunteers will be contributing to cutting edge science. And with that, I'm gonna hand the, the mic back to Martin, who's gonna tell you a little bit about how the tokens might work. Thank you. So as Cameron mentioned, uh, we are currently focusing on the, the Turing spaces that are known. And when we're addressing them uh, in, in the network, it goes in the following way. So someone who wants to participate signs up to the network to then allocate a batch of Turing machines. And this could be uh, 500 machines, for example. They compute them and submit them. And then we have a validator that verify the submission. And that means that we are comparing the results of the computing machines against the, of the, in the submission against the, the known values. And if they equate, the submitter is getting rewarded in a native token. If they don't equate, the submission don't pass and the user will not get rewarded and the batch remains open for another user to compute. But as we move towards new um, Turing spaces uh, or informally universes, um, we need to introduce some mechanisms that are awarding good behavior and punishing bad behavior. So for each submission that is being made, the uh, agent submitting it needs to also stake uh, some tokens. And then the validator will carry out a random sample test. So it will test perhaps um, two or 5% of the submitted Turing machines and compute them. And if they have the same value as the submission, then the uh, submitter gets awarded in a native token. And if they don't, the staked tokens are being taken by the, the protocol. So in this way, um, you incentivize good behavior. So thinking about uh, the tokenomics and how we use different tokens to drive certain behavior, we have landed on a, a two uh, token system and they fill, fill different functions. So the, the Turing cred equates to one Turing cred for each Turing machine in a Turing space. So um, we will see in the next slide how many Turing creds can be achieved in certain spaces. While the atomic coin uh, provides access to the estimated universal distribution and acts as a load balancer. And they are swapped for Turing creds at the end of the completion of a Turing space. And the reason we've done this is if we had one token uh, Turing creds, you can see here, this is the enumeration of Turing machines in different states for two symbol Turing machines. It goes from um, 11 billion up to, yeah, up to 26 uh, trillion. It is an uh, exponential increase of uh, machines and as a result, an exponential increase of Turing creds. So if we were to supply this amount of tokens as we complete universes, we will suffer from hyperinflation and there will be no way for any token to preserve any um, secondary value effectively. So by introducing the atomic coin at a steady state where we are uh, increasing percent for uh, Turing space that is completed, we are effectively creating a deflation or spiral, spiral in relation to the competition that is extended to complete a universe. So as you can see, it, uh, Turing creds are increased at a much higher frequency than the atomic coins, which means that you get a swap rate that just increases over time as well. And that means that people who want to get access to the estimated universal distribution need to hold 
a certain amount of atomic coins. And as new spaces are completed, they need to increase their holding in atomic coins to maintain their, their ratio. Um, and this um, results to an incentive to continuously mine the distribution, um, but also uh, it lowers the cost of access to the distribution. Because obviously anyone can do this themselves. They can effectively spin up a couple of virtual machines in AWS and start mining through uh, different Turing machines, but it will be incredibly uh, expensive on your own. Well, in this case, you just need to be responsible for mining or procuring some of the atomic coins at a fraction of the cost to get access to the newest uh, distribution. So you're essentially lowering the cost while incentivizing people to mine it and turning it into a continuous process that will just continue mine through, through time. So that's why this actually makes sense if you compare it to the, the baseline of how it's done now. Uh, and with that, I'll, I'll pass it over to Cameron. So now that you know a little bit about the token, let's talk about the prize. Uh, in order for the, 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 this, this library that we want to create that acts as an engine for our science to be incentivized, we need the token. But the, the library is definitely the goal. We want to have some sort of Turing tape version of George Borch's infinite library, which is also in some ways better because it's, it's, um, it's made purely of computational uh, perturbations. Can you go back? Sorry. S sorry. Um, and it will be continuously growing faster than any scholar could possibly cover the ground in the library. And our hope is that as the library expands and as it fills with scholars, the, the access that, that it's, that's given to them will, will result in AID and especially the CTM and BDM being applied to, to new domains and interesting new problems, increasing the usefulness of the library and by extension, the coin itself. Okay, now you go forward. Uh, to, to further anchor the, the utility of this library in practical application, we've come up with uh, just one example. The data compression mechanisms of today are primarily statistical in nature. They look for patterns in data that can be summarized in a way where the summary results in, in a proportional increase in the amount of data needed to be transferred. Uh, in contrast to those methods, we could provide an incremental algorithmic data compressor, which goes through our library and finds the smallest group of small Turing machines that can generate the, the, can, the, the data in question and the, thus the compressed ratio becomes the, the instruction set for these Turing machines versus the data itself. And uh, the interesting property here is that as the library grows, as we proceed to higher spaces and have a bigger catalog of Turing machines, we can describe more complicated data sets with this method and we can see by reapplying the incremental compress compressor over time, we will get a higher ratio of compressed to uncompressed data. And, uh, and, and so now we can shift gears and talk a little bit about concrete project objectives and where we stand. Right now, we're working towards uh, the creation of a volunteer swarm that allows unsophisticated um, participants without specialized hardware to participate in this novel research angle. And from the lessons learned from that, we're going to write a white paper that uh, covers all of our tokenomics and the research that's covered in this presentation as well as what we've learned so far from the volunteer swarm. And simultaneously in Q4, we will create, a, we'll start a foundation that will steward this whole process going forward. Um, and that'll move us into next year where we want to release the first computationally backed coin, the Turing cred, as a, a purely a reward for volunteers. And simultaneously, the foundation will work towards uh, owning and controlling a infrastructure for on-demand perturbation analysis and exposing that to researchers and hobbyists. And finally, we, we want to upgrade the uh, tokens so that there's a second coin, atomic coin, that releases, that exposes the universal distribution to researchers in, in a manner that hopefully encourages its use and cultivation going forward. 
And getting a little more concrete, uh, uh, this is a, a little schematic of how the volunteer swarm works now. If you're a volunteer and you want to contribute, you co contact the foreman who gives you a work allocation request. That work allocation is um, just a range of Turing machines that you are now kind of taking responsibility for. And if, if you compute them in a, a reasonable amount of time and submit them to our tape bank as a signed tapes, then the tape bank will validate a subset of them using the random sampling, like Martin said. And if you're in good standing with the tape bank, it'll report your credit, the credits you're owed to the foreman who will periodically distribute them as coins to, to the volunteer swarm. This is uh, exactly the pattern that, for instance, Gridcoin uses to incentivize participants in the Berkeley open infrastructure for network computing and uh, folding coin uses for incentivizing participants in the Stanford protein folding experiment. And it gives us a good leg to jump forward into the two coin system. Finally, now that you understand a little bit about where Automa coin is now, we'd like to end with a, an invitation. Uh, Marvin Minsky in his final years of life called to attention the algorithmic probability and encouraged everybody to learn about it and spend the rest of their lives working on it. So in that spirit, we'd like to invite early adopters who want to mine the distribution with their you know, home computer or something to, to, to find their way into the volunteer swarm. We'd like to invite anyone with a programming or design experience who wants to participate in development to, to reach out and perhaps find our code on GitHub. We, we're, we're innovating in the open, as is kind of the normal in, in, in both science and crypt, cryptocurrencies. So there's, there's a, a lot to be done. And we'd also like to especially invite researchers such as yourself who'd like to see the potential perhaps of this or of, of AAD more generally and, and would like to help co-develop this as, as a tool for scholars using early versions of it and providing feedback. If any of these call out to you, or if you're just generally interested in learning about more, you can go to the website, automacoin.com, and uh, we'll see you there. Thank you for your time. And uh, I guess this is, this is when we open it up for, for Q&A. Thank you, Cameron. Thank you, Martin. Uh, both of you are panelists. There is one question from Juan Carlos, but it is in the chat for the panelists. So if you can look at it there or because I, um, I don't have a permission to, so as a host, we don't have a permission to submit the question to Q&A. So, or if you want me, I can read it to you. This uh, Juan Carlos question. If you want to use this network to search for complex cellular automata where certain pr particular gliders are observed and you have the algorithm to search and the rule to validate or certify that one or more autonoma was found with the characteristic sought, how could it be used with this platform? Uh, I think this is asking if we can move from simple UTMs to kind of cataloging more interesting behavior like we discussed Langton's ant um, the, the, the commonly known one is uh, Conway's Game of Life. These are also, these would be useful to explore as well. And uh, we, we're going to look into that once we've kind of moved into a high enough space that the main avenue of, of uh, discovery, the universal Turing machine, is useful on its own. Did that answer your question? There is a question from uh, Luis Lopez. Could you describe more what could you do a volunteer for the project? What could do a volunteer for the project? Right. So there's, there are kind of several classes of volunteers, but the, the most of the volunteers that we expect to attract will be just uh, unsophisticated or they could be sophisticated, but they, they want a simple process to contribute their idle computing power to this venture instead of, for instance, mining Bitcoins or Ethereum and just wasting that electricity. So you would fire up your computer while you're sleeping or maybe in the future you have a PlayStation or something that's just sitting idle and you point it to our system and, and we'll report, we'll give you tape allocations and you report back the, the tapes themselves and in exchange you will get rewards that we hope 
based off the mechanisms we, we, we described in this conference talk will be compelling on their own right. The, the other type of volunteers that we need are actually people that contribute to uh, things like coding and those kind of things also for the project. Yeah, yeah. there's also uh, various kind of areas that are network we want to research further. Um, so as we're moving into writing the or formalizing a, a white paper, there will be plenty of questions that need to be addressed. So um, if people want to volunteer, they should just reach out and I guess we'll just get in touch and see where, where they will fit into the current, um, the current situation. Yeah. If you allow me also to elaborate a little bit on the motivation of the project, I, I think it is uh, twofold. One is we wanted to find a way to uh, continue calculating or if you wish estimating the universal distribution and CTM and those kind of uncomputable functions to make it self-sustainable right because it, it doesn't make much sense that perhaps a, a group of, of researchers are spending a lot of computation doing it themselves and if they disappear then everything goes to there's no more update updates anymore so by creating a, some sort of a cryptocurrency which is ex exactly what they do so so it is like kick-starting an economy right because you just push it a little bit and then it goes by its own and the idea is to create some incentives for others to keep calculating these things even if they they, they may be or may not be interested in in the particulars eh? so we want to find those kind of uh, mechanisms to to continue um, um, calculating these things and the other thing is that other cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, as you know, they spend a lot of computational uh, power, but it is all wasted. Yeah? So it is uh, need, needless to say that it is not uh, ecologically very friendly, but also all this computation uh, goes to nothing. Yeah? And, 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 and if we could replace those cryptocurrencies that are doing so much computation by something that is actually useful like this, because this is like so fundamental, and answering a little bit about the ECA question that um, someone um, asked. Uh, so there are various levels in which uh, that question could be answered uh, positively. One is we are like at a higher level, level of abstraction because if you are looking for gliders in a cellular automaton, you could use also the universal uh, distribution to, to characterize those patterns using Turing machines, you see? Uh, but, but I mean, that, that's perhaps what you meant on, or if you meant that actually you wanted to run a computation with cellular automata, that is something that we would also explore in the future. But right now we're focused on um, running Turing machines to continue estimating the universal distribution. And by the way, something that I, I think did, I didn't mention in my talk um, either is that even when this is uh, uh, computationally very expensive, you only have to um, compute it once, right? So once you have an estimation, you just keep it. So you create a database, a lookup table, and then instead of uh, spending exponential uh, computational time to uh, have access to that information, you just um, sc screen uh, or retrieve information from the lookup table. And as you know, it is in linear time no? or, or even constant time. So it, it is really profitable to do these computations beforehand and, and have, have it pre-computed. <laughs> 